So the great uh, seismic migration has begun, uh, as they say. Uh, real pleasure to be here, and, uh, and so let's move forward with that. Um, a little bit about Explorer and our DNA and providing some context for the discussion. Uh, we've been around since 1981. Uh, can a Canadian company, we're a private company, uh, and we were originally very focused on acquiring data in the frontiers, in challenging areas, and overcoming logistical and acquisition challenges, predominantly in the onshore environment. Uh, and to do that, we had to be innovative, uh, we had to have good operational integrity, and we had to be nimble and agile. Lately, we've pivoted from the physical frontiers, although we still operate there, uh, to the technological frontiers. And, and so that's what I'm gonna talk to you about today. Uh, this slide really uh, speaks to that. What you're looking at here is a drone image of, uh, at the time, the highest seismic trace density on Earth. Uh, this is uh, our, our pinpoint operations team uh, going through boreal forest without cutting seismic lines, without impacting the environment at all. Uh, and we achieved a trace density exceeding 100 million traces per square kilometer. This data set, which was a small test data set, one kilometer uh, by one kilometer, uh, generated 148 terabytes of data. So we're talking about orders of magnitude uh, greater data density uh, than ever before. Uh, and, and specifically today, I'm gonna to talk about a little bit about our size info uh, software and the cloud size uh, business of migrating our clients' data to the cloud. Of course, we're delighted to be an advanced technology partner with Amazon uh, in that journey. The general promise of the cloud is one of elasticity, uh, which produces speed, agility on demand, uh, giving even uh, very small uh, entry-level users global reach, and it actually allows companies to incur expenses that vary with usage instead of trying to predict capex for uh, the, the, the compute that you'll need and the storage side, size that you'll need. And for a company like ours that's innovating and driving trace densities through the roof, uh, that became very, very important, and we could see that a few years ago, uh, which is really how we started our journey. For those of you that are uh, looking at careers in geoscience, what it means for you and for your future is that the cloud will enable, will enable collaboration uh, like you've never seen before, uh, sharing uh, data in ways that uh, have been talked about earlier this morning, uh, innovation, and accelerated workflows. Uh, and you see that happening across the board. These are just a few examples, and I'm sure you'll hear about uh, at least one or two of these uh, in the next talk. Um, but all of these companies are talking about using data on the cloud uh, with the assumption that it's already there. The reality in industry is a little bit different. Um, we have uh, still many, many uh, millions and millions of, of uh, lines, of kilometers of lines, square kilometers of 3D that are stored like this. Uh, and this is actually a pretty well-organized storage facility uh, with a nice indexing. Uh, this is another example with older media, uh, again, very typical. So we're talking on one hand about machine learning and artificial intelligence and big data, big query, and yet the reality for much of the industry uh, is, is very much physical storage of legacy media. <clears throat> this is another example one of our clients uh, shared with us. Uh, and so there is a range of uh, possibilities when it comes to data management and data storage. And I, I would, I would uh, say that many of you have probably seen examples of of this kind of data storage uh, in your own careers. This is data migration, not done uh, correctly. My, uh, my son took this picture uh, as we were driving around in Calgary. Uh, there's a bit of data moving around in Calgary. This is not how you should move your seismic data, uh, but it, it's still a bit of the reality. Uh, so if you look at the, the cost of the status quo, and it's been alluded to earlier as people talk about uh, the need and the, and the vision of bringing data to the cloud. Uh, but today we have incredibly expensive, very inefficient storage uh, that makes the data inaccessible, unusable. Uh, and we're seeing uh, geoscientists spending the majority of their time often just trying to track this data down. Um, we also see that legacy storage providers typically will have a hostage style contract. They'll typically uh, allow you to store it, uh, ingest it, and then, uh, and I'm talking physical storage here, uh, and then if you want it back, you'll get charged huge money 
uh, to get the data, data back from, from storage. Uh, they'll call them deletion fees, and they can be as high as four cents a megabyte uh, for digital data. And we've seen examples of multi-million dollar deletion uh, uh, situations. Uh, so all of that is a barrier to progress, and it makes collaboration very difficult. Um, so our vision uh, for our own data initially and now for the broader industry uh, is that we can uh, get our data instantly. Uh, we call this data value maximization. Uh, and that geoscientists spend their time working with the data, not looking for their data. Uh, we envision a massive reduction in storage costs, and with our partners at AWS, we've been able to achieve that. Uh, for perspective, um, we can now store our data at less than one-tenth of one cent per gigabyte per month. So uh, it's a phenomenal reduction in storage costs. We're storing, uh, we're now storing over a petabyte of data at uh, those kind of rates. So um, when I say it's less than 1% of your current cost, that's absolutely uh, the case and we've, we've demonstrated that. Uh, along with that, once you can migrate your data to the cloud and you're storing it uh, in that way and in an organized indexed way, uh, the vision is for direct programmatic access to the entire seismic data library uh, that is validated, robust, and secure. Um, and we envision in the future that uh, data transactions will be medialist. We're all used to this in our personal lives uh, when it comes to uh, entertainment, movies, songs. Uh, we expect to get whatever song we want, whenever we want it, instantly. Same is true for TV show or, or any movie that we want to see. The vision is that we should be able to do that in our industry as well. Uh, and that'll support uh, rapid uh, data sharing and collaboration and the full utilization of all of the tools that, uh, that we've heard about. The journey looks a little bit like this. When we first started down this pathway a little over a year ago, uh, we thought that we would just jump to liberation and migration. In fact, we were, we were wrong about that. Uh, we learned that the first step is data discovery. Most, most of our clients actually don't even know uh, where their data is, how much they have, what media it's on, uh, what that looks like. And uh, so uh, data discovery, we found, was the first, uh, first order of business. And then we proceed with liberation and migration to drive to that uh, maximization. Different methods for doing this. Uh, you, you might have heard about the uh, AWS Snowball. We've got a picture of it up there. Uh, where we, uh, it's a secure, uh, encrypted, military-grade hard drive, ruggedized, field-ready, uh, and we can, we can use that to migrate data at scale. The one that is in this picture is actually the old one. Uh, it's, it only carries 80 terabytes, uh, which is more than enough for most uh, mid-sized uh, independent oil company data sets uh, and, and for many uh, legacy data sets. Uh, and we've actually successfully migrated uh, over, a t over a petabyte of data using uh, this device and the new Snowball Edge, which is a 100 terabyte device. If you have huge data volumes, uh, you could actually go to the uh, Snowmobile, which is uh, an AWS uh, device for petabyte scale migration. And along the way, we've uh, bumped into this issue of uh, extracting metadata on ingest. So folks are saying, well, you know, when the data's passing by, we want to be able to make use of it. But that's easier said than done. Uh, the reality with many legacy data sets is that uh, you'll be dealing with handwritten logs like this. Uh, and so our challenge here is to get industry to build the tools to extract uh, and, and in a tabular way extract uh, the data that's on these handwritten logs. Um, Amazon actually has a, a technology called Textract. Uh, but we haven't coded the required, uh, uh, we haven't built the required software. Uh, instead, what we did was we put out a challenge. Uh, people made fun of us because we only put up $5,000. Uh, so based on that feedback, we're boosting it to $20,000. Uh, it's kind of an open challenge to students or, or to folks that might be interested in playing with that machine learning and, and developing that ability to extract metadata on ingest. Okay, so that's the legacy data uh, kind of the problem uh, of the past and the status quo. Um, uh, but meanwhile, industries recognize the need for improved subsurface images. We heard about that a lot yesterday with carbon capture and storage and different, different ways of thinking about the reservoir. Uh, and and uh, 
that'll just drive improved certainty and, and reduce risk. Uh, BP has done a lot of work in how to deliver that. Uh, we really uh, follow them very, very closely on the, on the acquisition side of things. And this is a, a, a BP graphic here that on the vertical axis shows uh, increasing trace densities uh, measured in uh, traces per square meter or trace, millions of traces per square kilometer, same math. Uh, and what you can see is that as trace densities rise, uh, different attributes become increasingly reliable. Or the other way to look at it is with low trace densities, those seismic attributes are unreliable. And so there's been a general movement in industry to, to build uh, increasing trace densities for better data quality. <clears throat> Historical data quality, uh, at least onshore, um, in most parts of the world, uh, outside the Middle East, has been very, very low. It's been off the bottom of the chart. And we've been building uh, uh, this massive improvement in trace densities, which in turn is driving uh, huge increases in data volume. So um, this is another BP uh, graph from uh, Ted Manning and his group. Uh, this actually just came out in September, where they're plotting on a logarithmic scale uh, increasing trace densities as a function of time. And actually, our, uh, the survey that I talked about right at the beginning uh, is up at the top of that scale. Uh, it's one of those little uh, cluster at the top in 2018, 20, 2019 at 100 million plus traces per square. Um, so what happens is the legacy data sets measured very big data volumes, typically measured in gigabytes uh, per square kilometer. Uh, our trace densities today for this modern uh, high density stuff uh, they're, they're being measured in terabytes per square kilometer and sometimes hundreds of terabytes per square kilometer. And we see in the near future the drive to a billion traces per square. Uh, there are surveys being planned like that right now and that'll drive petabyte per square kilometer scale. So that's where the industry's going. Creates a huge problem for people who are, uh, who are invested in, in uh, their own data centers and who are trying to keep pace with uh, that, that uh, rate of innovation. The other thing this, this requires, and we've all found this out at various times, when you start getting above 10 million into the tens or hundreds of millions of traces per square, uh, processing methods need to change, uh, the IT infrastructure changes, and uh, the cloud really offers an enormous uh, benefit to uh, companies that are operating in that space. Um, still early days in terms of software running on the cloud, as we've heard, but it's definitely coming and uh, the drive to high trace densities will certainly uh, uh, push, push us all in that direction. Uh, and the other thing that we've talked a little bit about, the hunt for data being a, a barrier to value, uh, all the time that it takes to go find your data. Uh, but the other thing that's really a massive barrier is uh, seismic data processing timelines. And we think that uh, using uh, massively parallel uh, high performance computing on the cloud, taking advantage of that scale would, uh, should transform uh, the way that we think about those timelines. Uh, our vision is to bring, uh, you know, to take us from sort of six, 12, 18 month processing timelines to six day processing timelines, if we can, or maybe six hour processing timelines. Uh, and so with high density data, uh, we have an opportunity to sort of stop uh, stop the bleeding, if you will, uh, in order, and so and not adding to the media problem, not adding to the future migration problem. And what we've started doing is, uh, in a first for the onshore business anyway, is migrating directly to the cloud from the field. So here you're seeing one of our uh, land node reaping trailers uh, in the field. You can see kind of rugged field conditions and uh, the snowball there on the counter uh, so that we're avoiding any media, no tapes, no USB drives, uh, it goes onto the snowball and straight, straight to the cloud. Um, that actually accelerates the workflows. Just transcribing data can take days at uh, this kind of scale, days or weeks. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. And then, the, the, as you can see, it shortens the pathway to uh, data value maximization. So the migration's underway. Uh, you know, it's uh, like any great migration, though. Uh, I'm not sure everybody will make it. Uh, there are perils on the way and pitfalls, and uh, hopefully we'll work together and navigate past those. Thank you. <laughs>